Hey everyone, welcome to the self-publishing podcast. Um, today we're going to be talking about, um, I mean, you called this first year, first year writer. Do you want to describe a little bit more there? Uh, Sean, unfortunately, who's got a mouthful of nuts. Hey Dave, do you want to take a, a shot at it? No, what? don't no. bother Sean. He's tweeting the show. <laughs> How long does it take to swallow nuts, man? Come on. You should have plenty of practice. All right. Well, so something about the first year writer with uh, Quig McDonald. Uh, I'm sure we'll talk about that later. So that's good stuff. And we'll oh, hold on. I see an unmute. <laughs> yeah, um, actually. It, yeah. First year writer. Um, Quig is just awesome. We, we met him um, through Apprentice last year. And he's just, he totally has his shit together. Really funny guy, uh, written for TV, done stand up, and um, wrote a really great book with a really great cover and has just kind of killed it in his first year. So there's, um, I'm sure he has a lot to say, but I think one of the things we want to focus on is kind of how he deals with writing comedy too, because uh, as Dave says, that's a really hard thing to do. And Queeb has great insight into that. So he's just a great guy and all around hilarious. And I think it'll be really, really fun to have him. So who's got uh, something cool? Let me do mine last. I'm looking for the note. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'll just go. I just started watching Who's American. Show notes from last episode. <laughs> I've been watching uh, American Horror Story, um, which is, uh, I guess it's in its seventh season now. But Did you say you didn't start at the beginning? I didn't start at the beginning because it doesn't matter every season is totally different and the reason i even started to watch it i wanted to watch it forever Haley actually really wants to watch it but i just hadn't started and cindy and i were watching the lady gaga documentary on um uh, on a uh, netflix yeah. yeah and there's a part yeah. where it's good it's good i mean i think all smarter artists should watch that because she's a smarter artist like she's she knows exactly what she's doing she's done some amazing things with her career she's you know, handled her audience really well. You know, we just talked last episode about meeting re reader expectations. I think she does a really good job of meeting her fans' expectations and really building a brand around herself and the, the way that she wants to create art. So yeah, it was, it was a good documentary. But in part of it, she's dressing up for her role in American Horror Story. And I thought, well, that, that's cool. And so we were just in between things. We watched something, I don't remember, but it was sucky enough that it only got to a pilot episode. And we're like, ah, let's see what else is on. And we put on American Horror Story and just started on season six because she's in that. And Kathy Bates is in it. I know she's in a bunch of seasons, but it was, it was, it's solid. We're only on episode three, but I really like how they do it. And it's like, a, is it remember, really I remember the first seat because I watched the first season and I remember thinking, Wow, this is genuinely freaky. Like, yeah, it's it's freaky for sure. There's uh, there's like witches in the woods. It reminded me actually of um, this thing that that Dave and I just mapped out a couple weeks ago um, that had like colonial witches <laughs> in it, and uh, this this had some of that vibe. Um, but it's done like is the first season done like this, Johnny? Is it done like uh, like an old um, America's Most Wanted, where they have dramatic reenactments? Not that I remember. Okay, so they've got, they've got actors who are telling their story to the camera, and then they have dramatic reenactments that are that so much. also done with the camera. No, it, it works for me. It works for me on Actually, this. I forgot. I started watching that exact season, and I <laughs> saw that they were doing that. I said, fuck this. I'm out of here. Yeah, I, I actually like it. It, it, more it, it works for me. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, anyway, it, it doesn't need more Alf. That's my something cool. So mine, mine actually isn't that cool. It's actually kind of- Oh, tell us more. Lame. It's actually a little shitty, Wait, but it is Oh, something, it's, is this Dave something cool? Wow. It's actually, but it's something that, that we learned in new glaring color at Nink. And I think that it's the sort of thing- Oh, you guys, I know what this is. But be, but, oh my God, Sean, <laughs> really, you do my something cool. Well, you told me that you were not used to me not talking last episode. I just talk all episodes. I'm yeah, trying to make up for it. You right. step on every joke Queeb does. <laughs> but basically, um, we, this is something that came to new light at, at Nink for us, like in a way that I think that you guys are going to want to know about this. And so it's not something cool so much as something to note. And it's, you know, Tammy has been telling us about how important um, Amazon also bots are. And we, we knew that. And we, it's a big deal. Like you need the machines at Amazon for the machine learning need to understand exactly Skynet. who to, to Skynet to sell your book to. But 
I didn't, I didn't notice the degree of it until we went to Nink and um, started talking to some people and just had this slow creeping realization of, oh, we do the exact same thing that um, this person, this person, this person is doing and get a, a, a result that's a fifth as much or less because we have like writer stuff in our also bots. Like we have so many writers and stuff come into our, our, our pages. And so pure also bots, really, really, really important. Not cool for us, maybe cool for you. Yeah, no, this is- We uh, can't do a show anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no. uh, kind of, I mean, honestly, like this show is expensive. It is. Yeah, it, this show is really expensive and, and it, it becomes clearer and clearer all the time because, I mean, not that we're going anywhere, guys, like we're gonna do this. Not, but, that, we, not that we resent it in any way, but, but it is- it But is it is a fact, I, yeah. I, yeah. Da- okay, Dave does resent it. Right. <laughs> Actually, and, and it hit Dave hardest this time because we've worked a year on, working on a um, series that I'm not even going to tell you the name of because fuck <laughs> you guys. And so, so Dave- called Salem's Lot. Yeah. <laughs> so Dave, Dave, you know, we, we finally get this to market. It's really awesome. We launch it. He mentions it, I think, accidentally on boot camp last week. And sure enough, like our, our ranking just tanked and our also bots are filled with like right to market and stuff. And so Amazon just shrugs and says, I have no idea who your buyer is and they just stop serving it. And, and that sucks. And it happens constantly. Well, so at least I know everybody that bought the book that's in our audience will leave a nice glowing review. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. That will surely happen. Um, welcome Queeve. I feel like Queeve should do his something cool before Dave because Dave did say he wanted to go last. Oh, I'm oh, right. right. No, okay. Well, you guys can fight it out then. No, no. I, I want to hear your something cool and I want to hear Queeve. Queeve's always got something cool. Okay. So, so mine is uh, Jay Thorne, Zach Bohannon. Uh, last year, they did Authors on a Train uh, where they got together with uh, Joanna Penn and Libby. Was it Libby that they got with? Mm -hmm. I thought it was Samuel L. Jackson if it's something on us. And basically, you know, they they, they wrote a book. uh, They collaborated on a book together. It was a trip from uh, to New Orleans. I forget where it was from. Chicago? I don't remember. Anyway, they're doing it again. um, 2018, um, June 3rd through 8th. So if you want to go and do that... um, not sure of all the details or what it costs or if there is a cost, whatever. Uh, but it's called authors on a and, and it is something that I actually would. Authors do. on a train really does sound um, like a joke. Authors on a motherfucking train. Yeah. <laughs> it is something that I would do, but I don't know. You wouldn't. <laughs> if, it, if it left from where I am to you go mean your front door. Yeah, like if there was a train. What if there were an author train between <laughs> Redacted and where we were for Nang? Then yes, I would have done that. Uh, what if we had taken that train back to your door, though? Uh, no, you can't do that. Everybody it only goes off. one way? Uh, yeah, I, I want to see them combine this with Soul Train. That would be the best of all trains. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> Authors on Soul Train? Yeah, <laughs> that would be so fucking awesome with Don Cornelius and... <laughs> oh, sweet. Okay. Uh, they, uh, what I'm looking at here is they have sponsors for this. We got to do some, we got to get sponsor for some weird, crazy thing we're going to do. So, like the Smart Artist Summit? We're on uh, it, Dave. No, no, no. <laughs> I, something like experimental, like, uh, I don't know, Dave on a train by himself. <laughs> <laughs> I would, I, I'm fronting that right now. I also, okay, how about we do a, like a trip to Colorado, like a writer's retreat in Colorado where Dave um, gets high? Yes, and we can sponsor that. Dave, <laughs> if we do a writer's retreat in Colorado, will you get high? Yes. Oh, oh, who wants to do a writer's retreat in Colorado? I do, I do. Okay, we're putting that on 2018. I'm not even kidding. You guys all heard it. He said he was going to do it. <laughs> Queen, are you coming? 2018. Oh, yeah, yeah. To see Dave leave the house and get high, of course I'm coming for that. <laughs> okay, this is so fantastic. I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm in the wrong meeting because that's not the Dave I was expecting at all. No, to- this is great. This is going to happen. It's, it's the Sterling and Stoners 2018. <laughs> that's what's happening. And I am, I am decidedly anti-drug. And, like, I, I don't care who does drugs. Like, I got no problem there. Uh, but I grew up, like, with an alcoholic uncle, so it scared me completely straight. And I am, like, a complete control freak. But there is a part of me that would love to just fucking relax for once in my 
Oh, Damn. we'd all love it too, Dave. This is really no. It's Sterling and Stoned, 2018 in Colorado. It's going to happen. This feels like an intervention, but go on the wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but it's can like we do most, heroin too? Like most interventions, it's long, long overdue. <laughs> all right, welcome, Queeve. Um, as we were saying earlier, you, dude, you have had just a fantastic first year, and it is for all the right reasons. Um, this is not somebody like the algorithms have been kind to you, but that is not what you are building your career on. You're building it on storycraft and humor and connecting with your audience and old fashioned hustle <laughs> and all of that. So um, I do want to get Everyone knows that humor is where all the easy money is made. <laughs> yes, yeah. Very definitely. Right. <laughs> right. Um, so yes, I think that you had an amazing year and um, and we want to talk a little bit about that, but I also want to talk just about comedy. But do you want to talk just to get started about what about your first year, kind of in short, and what were the things that you think really, really helped you? And what were the things that you think kind of held you back and you wish that you knew now what you didn't know then? I think the single biggest thing, genuinely, if I'd known is, I remember like last August, my first book came out with pretty much like 30th of August, actually last year. Um, and I can remember being really stressed for the whole of August, freaking out, frankly. And I remember. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I was, I was properly stressed out. And I was just because I was, I, I actually, just to give it some context, like I wrote the book and I sent it off and I have a reasonably good CV. I was like nominated for a BAFTA and stuff. I've written for a lot of what you call primetime TV in Britain and things like that. Um, and I basically, the big thing I got back from traditional publishing was comedy and crime, which is what I write, definitely doesn't mix. It's a big golden rule. It doesn't mix as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Um, which actually turned out great, by the way, because it turns out there isn't that many books in that space that traditional push, publishing pushed out. So it's a great way of finding a gap in the market. If you can get traditional publishing to tell you what you do is a bad idea, then it turns out you've got a great big gap in your market, um, <laughs> which is great. So, yeah, I want that t-shirt. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I've got a big gap in my market. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the wine thing collection. No, um, but yes, um, yeah, so it was great. I managed to, you know, I, I got the books out there and um, I think it just sort of gradually gave it time. I think everybody freaks out going, oh, people aren't watching. I remember the first week it came out and I was like, oh, this isn't going as well as I thought. Because all the thought, things I thought would work in the first week didn't. And then you kind of realize and you're going to go back, like things like the mailing list, like I've heard you guys explain the mailing list loads of times. And then you kind of get to a point where you go, oh, I get this now. This is why I have, I now have the automated sequence and stuff. And I'm, I'm, that's going really well for me now because I figured out how to onboard people properly. Um, but I think the biggest thing is generally um, you kind of have to relax and give it time because it's so overwhelming as a, as a new author. But it's one of those things that once you learn it, you know it and you gradually get things as you go. And I think that's the big thing that I learned. Um, Do you feel like you're more patient now than you were before? Yeah, I think I definitely I sort of freak out a lot less now because like the books have gone well and I've had that thing where people have liked them and it's got nice reviews. So like if somebody gives it a bad review now, which you'll occasionally get, because I'll get like, you guys get the, the reviews where people give out about swearing and stuff a lot. Don't oh, you? I've been, we, we were called a maggot crawling out of a trash can. It was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's, that's pretty important. That should be a t-shirt. Um, <laughs> But yeah, no, I got, I remember telling my mother, I got an email when I was at home in Dublin and uh, I genuinely got, like I said, I went to my mother and went, oh, some, um, Amer some guy in America just sent me an email saying he's not reading my books because of all the blasphemy. And my mother, <laughs> honest, my brother's, my mother's honest words were, Jesus Christ, what did you say? Because <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly how Irish people talk. We don't mean it in any other way. It's just a part of our, and my books are set in Ireland. So, um, <laughs> So yeah, you will always get a little bit of things like that. But generally, yeah, now I'm sort of a lot more relaxed about these things because it's kind of, you know, the machine is sort of rolling on. And like everybody, I'm always looking at Well, yeah, you, you have to take one-star reviews as that's just part of it. If you don't have anything, then so, like something's wrong. You're not selling enough books if you don't have any one-star reviews. Yeah, you'd always get the album. I mean, generally, my reviews have been really nice and um, been really positive. And um, what's really interesting is most of my sales are in America. And I like some people say, oh, people don't get this. It's too Irish. Almost all of my sales seem to be in America and not from Irish. Oh, America. dude. No, no, no. Those people don't know what they're talking about. Like people like Dave, his serious fetish here, right? We auto <laughs> And me too. Like totally me too. I like things He's automatically right. better. He's all your stuff with his pants off. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> um, let, let's talk about your cover too, because I know we've referenced your cover a few times on the we show. We actually have. It's most referenced cover on the show. It, it might be just because yeah. it does break the rules. Like it doesn't. It doesn't necessarily fit the genre, and yet it totally does. 
it really harkens back to, it looks almost like a, an old like Hitchcock vertigo style poster. Mm-hmm. It, it really, really works for me on every level. Um, I look at that cover and I think I want to read that book and every book in that world. And so, um, but, but you didn't, that wasn't even really intentional, right? That was a 99 yeah. Designs ad? It the, was a 99 Designs thing, because basically um, when they say like sort of match something in your genre, there's not a lot of comedy crime, like there's Carl Hyatt and things like that. Um, but there wasn't a huge amount of things. And we kind of went, well, there's not much we can kind of, you know, mirror anyway. So we might as well see it as a blessing and just go for something cool. And I just quite like that idea. So I think I sort of, the 99 Designs thing, you can give people, as you know, the examples of various different things. So I gave him a lot of like Raymond Chandler books and things like that. And um, I had an idea for it and it worked out, you know, obviously I got, I got lucky, but it worked out really well. But I got lucky because I, I went through the process as well as, you know, and gave it as much energy as possible to make sure that it- But, okay, okay. Yeah, so I, I need to redirect you there because oh. that wasn't, that oh, wasn't yeah. luck. Uh, <laughs> I was just going to say, we should mention the name of the book, but now I'm thinking I shouldn't after my- No, season. no, don't mention I'm the off. name of the book. Right. Don't mention the name of the book. Um, <laughs> sorry, guys, you've ruined it for all totally of us. totally different name. Don't even look. <laughs> his, his pen name is, fuck you guys. Well, no, <laughs> nobody will even know how to spell his name. To yeah, me. That's, that's, yeah, that's, that's actually I, true. You're safe. Yeah, and, my superpower is that they'll literally never get me for anything because like, no one can spell my name. And there will be no show notes for this show. <laughs> <laughs> Whatsoever. We're going back. You're protected, Queen. Wow, this right, is so. a great way to get authors on the show. We're not going to publicize <laughs> you at all. Tell them what your name is. Well, this may be the I show where they actually... Who wants to hurt you. Right. This is the show where actually you don't take a dip in sales. It works. <laughs> so, um, uh, okay, so when you saw that cover, did, was it... You knew you were going against the grain, but you thought it was worth it to take that risk. So that's that's point number one. But point number two is I just I don't I don't believe that that was lucky. I remember that contest, dude. You were hustling. We've run a lot of ninety nine design contests. We're pretty lazy. <laughs> like we we get them out and we really hope for a good result. You were not hoping for a good result. You treated that contest like it really truly deeply mattered, and it did. And we see this a year later. I think that the success of your book had a lot to do with that cover and the fact that you'd never been on the show before. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I think this is very much the, the, start, the decline starts now. Um, but I'll end up living in, in like, uh, or I'll end up living in um, Oregon in a year's time, just me and Dave in a cabin getting high. Uh, <laughs> no careers we used to have. Dude, that uh, is a future I can totally get behind. <laughs> I mean, it sucks for you guys, but it would be great entertainment. That's what happens after the apocalypse. If you could live stream that somehow. Uh, so, so anyway, how how... When you did that, how did you feel? Did you feel confident? Did you feel like it's my first book, so it matters even more, or maybe it matters even less? Yeah, I mean, no, I think I genuinely wanted to make it as good as possible, and I was very determined because, you know, we all had that thing with the people look down their noses at self-publishing, and, you know, I'm, I'm always explaining to people how it is. There's so much good quality now. And you're coming from a, a, a professional world already. You've already been a recognized writer, so yeah. it, it's... I think that was- that was part of it as well. So like my wife comes from a publishing background, educational publishing. So she was very much spend the money and get the best. Like I got a really good editor as well, which was brilliant. Um, and it definitely made the book better. Um, and I think I did come from a position where I did invest in the book because, you know, I was quite lucky in the sense that my, I went to my wife and said, look, it's going to cost this much. And she said, well, just spend the money because all your stupid ideas up until now worked out reasonably well. Like they, <laughs> That's <laughs> where we stuff. are too. It's a really good place to be. <laughs> Yeah, when you're when you just your stupid ideas work out a couple of times, people give you a lot of leeway. So um, yeah, and I think it did just sort of hustle. When you, I think that cover was really like when we had a competition, people really liked it. Like interestingly, I just did my my third release just over a month ago, and on that cover I had a competition, and the one I liked the most came fifth out of six, and the one my wife liked came fourth out of six, and we actually went with the one that most people did genuinely like, because mm. um, I think we sort of respected the opinion of the crowd, I guess. Um, but yeah, I mean, obviously, if, if you can get a cover like that, and I say, yeah, I don't like, I probably shouldn't say lucky because we did put a lot of work into it, but it does, it does really pay off because I think you can, you can use to your advantage the fact that um, if you don't fit the market in certain ways, you can kind of make a, you know, a plus out of it and go, look, this is different to anything else you've, you've read. And we did blog tours and stuff, and we got a lot of bloggers coming back to us going, oh, wow, this is not another version of Girl on a Train. This is so exciting because <laughs> got the same book over and over again from all the publishers. So you can use that as a positive, I think. Yeah, well, again, this is why I think you're such a great example because <clears throat> all of these things that you've, you've been very successful at many ticks along the road here and all of them have been 
because you really are very clear on your why and you don't really stray from that. So you're, you're willing to experiment and you pretty much don't take anything as dogma and you have a really nice blend of, okay, here's what my instincts say and here's what the smart people around me have said and here's how I'm going to apply that. And it's a really good recipe because you see it in, in practical terms. You've done things that, okay, blog tours, I cannot prove the ROI on that ever. Going from a non-genre cover, that's hard to ROI, right? You, you took your first book and you went for the very best editor that you could instead of iterating forward. Like all along the way, uh, you have made decisions that are long-term. I want to build the best possible career, you know, for myself. And it's just, it's really awesome. So let, let's, let's actually transition into talking about comedy because I think that's the biggest thing <laughs> that's the biggest risk here because writing comedy is hard and making money writing comedy is even more difficult. Uh, at least publishing. You don't have, <clears throat> people aren't looking for it the same way. I think you even made this point in a blog post that you wrote that comedy is not a genre, it's, it's a device, right? So let's talk a little bit about that. But I want to start with the question. Dave says it's the hardest thing in the world to do. Would you agree with that? It is. Uh, well, I brain surgeons might argue against that. Well, I mean, it's, the hardest thing to write. Hmm? it's the hardest yeah. thing to write. I, I mean, to be honest, I, I get, I know people have said that and I think it's, it's very easy to get wrong because there's loads of examples we can all give of people getting it wrong. But I guess the other thing is I've been like, I've been professional at comedy now since 2002, maybe. And um, I think genuinely it's an instinct with me that I, I kind of do that. Like when I write now, I write the narrative. I, I, I sort of block out the narrative. Like I just got my own office space for the first week for my writing thing. And I've got, I, I bought an enormous cork board where I do this thing where I put all the cards in it. And I just write out the narrative things that need to happen. And I'm kind of now I have the confidence after three books to go, um, I can make that funny, that would be fine. I'm not worried about the path. But I think at the same time, I can write funny, but then you have to edit really hard. Because mm -hmm. I think the biggest thing, Dave, I would agree with is if you do a joke and people don't like it, they will get angry at you really quickly. <laughs> like, you can lose a reader the fastest in, in comedy because if they, if they think you've tried to do a joke and failed, they'll hate you for it. So it's not even like the, uh, it's not that it's that much more difficult necessarily. It's that the margin for error is so slim. Yeah, I would agree with that. Like, I mean, one of the best notes I got from my editor um, was he went through my final scene in my first book and he said, this is a good joke, this is a good joke, this is a good joke. And you're taking them all out because you're undercutting the drama of the scene. And if you sell the story short, and he was exactly right, because you have to do it at the right time. Uh -huh. You have to kind of, because otherwise, if it just, if a book feels like it's just some bloke trying to shove jokes at you, then that gets tedious. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I'm going to bring this back to, this is, this is an old thing between Dave and I. So we had a, our book, Monstrous, and the main character was a stand-up comic. And... Um, and Dave would not put any jokes in the book. No. Like he just, he, he would not put any jokes in the book. And yet the, now I didn't want like a laugh riot at all, but this is a funny guy. Like we were basing it on Louis CK. Like that's who it was in my head. Yeah. Um, but most comics are miserable fucks and they're not who, thinking who, funny things. Bullshit, dude. They have funny thoughts. I, I do not. They're not that. inserting it all the time. Like, like Peter Parker and, and fucking Spider-Man. It, it's not one line. I, I, but it wasn't, it wasn't that there's a difference between Peter Parker and Spider-Man and no jokes from a guy who makes his living as a comedian. I don't, I didn't buy that as the character. Cueve, Cueve wants to yeah. talk. Go ahead. I was gonna, in a way, you're both right. Uh, I feel like a marriage guidance counselor now. <laughs> My <laughs> love language is words of affirmation, Queen. I need Dave to validate me. Well, no, you, pick the, you pick the wrong guy to do that. <laughs> that is not what he does. Yeah, ask my wife. <laughs> <laughs> Take my wife, please. Um, but yeah, I think the comics, um, they can be very miserable people. I know quite a few of them. Um, I think as well, yeah, the story of, we do have a lot, we do laugh a lot. Like my two closest friends are also comics and I support them on tour. We spend a lot of time in cars together, just having ridiculously, like there is a thing like one of my friends who she just brought out her autobiography, which is quite a big comic in Britain. And I genuinely have this thing with her as a joke where I tour with her husband and like me and him are in a car. And for the next three months, I'm going to see how many stories I can take from her life and put them into the conversation in the car and pass them off as my own. This is, <laughs> this is how, how bored I get the character for it. Like, I will think three months ahead to try and do a joke and see if it'll work. 
So we are, <laughs> we are the kind of people that will commit to a stupid idea very much. But yeah, you do get comics crack, crack a lot of jokes when they're talking and stuff, but it's a different kind. Comics have incredibly, to be honest, in a dressing room, you will get amazingly dark comedy. Well, like you, I, I think if you're stressed, I think it, it, you, go back, you go back to, it's almost fight or flight. And for a comic, like in a really stressful situation, they're going to be thinking mean cutting things in their head. I just, I, I think that they would. If you're in a monologue and you're Louis C.K. and you're in, you know, like a dire straits, you're going to think some funny stuff. And now, they're not necessarily things that you would repeat like on stage, but the nature of your life is that's how you observe the world through a very certain prism. That's what gives you your stage presence. And I don't believe that that prism disappears under times of duress. No, and it's, there is actually a weird little thing I have noticed where, and a friend of mine said the same thing when he got mugged, uh, because you get an adrenaline surge, and the only time you ever have that adrenaline surge, if you're a lazy bloke like me, is when you're on stage. Both of us had a situation where someone tried to mug us, and we started being, <laughs> basically making a joke out of it, because it just sort of like instinct kicked in. Um, so you do, it, I mean, it, it does blend in. I mean, um, I can remember like my wife, uh, she used, before she was my wife, we lived together uh, with my friend Gary, who's a comedian as well. And one of her friends asking her about, oh, you live with two comedians. That must be like a laugh riot 24-7. And she just, sort of, <laughs> she just sort of stopped and went, well, they will ruin a film for you. I don't know if that's the same thing. Because that's <laughs> all we do is just sit there and analyze jokes. Um, so, yeah, there is a bit of that. But comics are, particularly amongst each other, they almost like compete to say dark things to each other. Like, put it this way. Uh, you could ruin almost every good comedy career by having a recording of what they said in the dressing room. Because they're all like comics deliberately, like you guys do amongst yourselves. You say things to each other you would never yeah. say to, you know, the wider public. Comics do that an awful lot to the point where, you know, you'd really, if somebody walked in, they'd be justifiably horrified. But in the context of them trying to push each other. Right. Out. Most comedians have their version of the aristocrats. Okay. Right? And, here, and here's the deal. Uh, for, for Monstrous, I think... I, I have written comedy before. I've written uh, like blogs and I wrote in a newspaper. Like I, I did a column that was, you know, had some humor to it, but it, it's a very difficult rhythm uh, to get right for me anyway. I'm not as natural to it as you. Uh, and but that's I, not true, Dave. You've written shut, some shut of up. the funniest emails anyone has ever written okay. before. But, but it, it would not work with that particular book. I didn't feel. And if that's what I feel, that's what I fucking feel. And but I'm you're not- still wrong. How does it, okay, Baricio is funny. I'm right, I'm, fuck you. <laughs> I know, but see, there's funny and there's doing stand-up in a book. And Dave is right here because I- But there's no, but there's no stand-up you. in the book. There's, okay, Dave, yeah. okay, why does Baricio work, Dave? Why does Baricio work? Okay, I'm not talking about Baricio. <laughs> but he's funny if i had pitched that i'm gonna have this serial killer who's funny you'd have been like fuck you that's not gonna work but yeah, baricio well, works really right. really well, well and i it, didn't want this character to be mr laugh riot all right he's okay. not mr laugh riot but you changed the nature we're of talking who he about is. us we should be talking about queen here <laughs> so John, johnny how are you <laughs> i feel like i was i was actually uh, you're queuing me up thank you for thank you. you got my slack message because I was actually thinking, um, I was thinking the same thing. Because somebody, people have asked me about humor. Because, I mean, I don't, I don't think anything I have would be put into humor. But they're like fat vampire. Has, humor is definitely a thread, even in our serious books. There's there's humor in most of our stuff. Right. So my answer to that is, and and I don't know how you'll if you'll agree or or what with this quiv, but it's in in the way that at least I write, I don't, I don't write funny like i don't i don't try to think of like what's what's a uh, a pratfall that i can do or something what's a it's more like the people are funny it's like a situation is funny it, it it comes up in little little jokes or things that occur to me in the spur of writing it's not it's not like i set out to what would be a hilarious concept to do although admittedly fat vampire is a little funny as a concept but i i mean i see what dave is saying and i agree and i agree with with sean and i do insert comedy into a lot of our stuff there's a lot of Yes, absolutely. All I wanted from Monstrous was what I've seen you do a million times. But for some reason, in the book about a stand-up comic, (laughs) you wouldn't allow it. (laughs) That's crazy. He he lost everything. He's not in a funny mood, okay? (laughs) But that's exactly the point. Talk to John. Comedy, look, Louis C.K.'s comedy does, no, Queef, tell me, tell me I'm not wrong here. Louis C.K.'s best comedy or any comic's best comedy is not coming from a funny place. It's coming from a place of pain. That's exactly the point. It it can. There's a a few different types of comedy, but it certainly can. But I mean, again, it is context. And I think, I think 
I would say Dave is right in the sense that if he doesn't feel it as a writer, you <laughs> could never push it in. Um, <laughs> for those, for those wow, on the audio, it. Dave has made hand gestures. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, because I mean, I think that's the big, biggest mistake when I was writing this blog about how you write comedy is, and I've seen it a few times, is um, if people don't like, comedy serves narrative. Narrative does not serve comedy. Agreed. If like pushing people into a sausage factory because you've got a pun you want to do, then I'm not reading the fucking book. I <laughs> it, and people do that when it's done. But I can remember being in a car with my wife years ago and she was asleep, but she almost always is a long journey. I was listening to an audio book uh, of a, a comedy crime writer who I won't obviously name. Um, and I got to the end of this scene and he must No one's listening right now. What's his name? No, I'm definitely, I'm definitely not telling this guy's name. My wife said, you're never going to say that name. I'll never say it. But like three minutes we were going through, it must have been a few pages. And it was literally to get to an end of a chapter where he thought of a pun. And I like, it oh. just it got to this. And my wife, who I thought was asleep, genuinely went, oh, fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> she woke up to swear at it. Because he was that. And that was the point I went, if you ever get the joke and it doesn't work. Because that was a big thing I was going to say. You know the Stephen King rule we've all quoted about... Um, if half people say it's like something, half people don't, yeah. you're being the readers, it goes with the house. I don't think that is the same with comedy, which I, know I, I, I agree with you. Yeah. I think if you have like six people read something and if two people have a problem with it, you need to have a long, hard look at it because um, it's just the, the, the percentages are different, I think, um, because you will annoy people if they don't like it. Well, it, it reminds me a little bit of um, some of the criticism that like M. Night Shyamalan has gotten about how it becomes all about the twist, right? So the movie is a setup for the twist in the movies that people don't feel worked as well. And what you just described reminds me of the book is not waiting for the punchline, right? So it needs to be something that is funny throughout rather than something that's like, you get to the end and the joke doesn't work and it ruins the whole preceding thing, like, oh, fuck off. Then that was a failure. It needs to be something where the joke can work or not work and then it, the scene proceeds and it the still has The story has works without the jokes. You actually care about the people in the story. Exactly. And I think that's the biggest thing as well as character is the big thing with like, I think I think mentioned this in that blog I did, which was uh, there's a test they have as script writers, which I think works in, in, in novels as well, where if you should be able to read through the lines of a, of a sitcom and you should be able to tell who's going to say the line, if you just get the piece of dialogue, like you can do it with friends. And if you take one of the lines, you can tell which one of the six of them was saying that line, because ideally they should suit the character and they should, they should, people shouldn't say things out of con like, Joey can say something out of context as a joke because we all know who Joey is. But it's in the first episode, Joey has to say the kind of things that you want to establish his character. He can't go against type. Otherwise, you just sort of ruin the feel of it and it doesn't feel real, I think. And, is a and, and I would say that writing comedy and writing horror are very similar in that if you don't write something that I care about, I don't care about the other element. I don't care about the joke and I don't oh, care about Oh, that's a really horror. good point, Dave. Yeah, absolutely. You, you've got to have the sort of the consequences of things. And the other thing was, it's similar with horror as well is um, you've got to know when to put the shock moment in the sort of the twist because they yes. have to turn because comedy is all about setting up and then changing the, the way it goes as, as is horror. That's the big thing. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming that I'm too scared to read almost all horror. I'm a big wuss. Um, I literally go, I used to go to my, I used to go to see cartoons in the cinema when my, my, my flatmate went to see the horror thing on the next screen. But, um, but they do work on very similar principles. Um, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, what about um, referencing things? So, uh, <laughs> you're, <laughs> you know where that's going, just take it. Well, I was, because yeah, because this is the other thing I said, because I think it's something you will see in comedy as well, is there are like really successful books in genres, like there's a couple of fantasy ones and stuff I always see in the charts, and like, I can't remember this guy's name, but he obviously, his books are clearly great, but they're all about role-playing uh, funny ones, and like, they, they, everyone goes to number one in this charts. He's obviously great at it. And you can def if you're thing is if you're doing a particular genre, I think you can if you're using things that people know in that genre, you can do be great as long as you know that's your audience. But like you can lose like for example, I'm obviously Irish. I live in Britain. Um, you will get American shows that have references to things that you don't understand. And thing in comedy, if you don't get the reference, you aren't going to understand the joke, and then you'll get oh this isn't for me. So it's something you have to be aware of. Like the other side of it is, I think Galaxy Quest is a brilliant film because uh, my wife never saw Star Trek. She watched Galaxy Quest and absolutely got it because it was a really well done thing. And you cared about the characters like Dave was saying and the narrative drove it. It wasn't just there to try and set up a next silly joke about Star Trek. Um, and I think- Okay, so what's the, what's the line between, you know, because 
I can also make the other argument that specificity is funny, right? If you tell a joke that only a few people are going to get, but they really get it, like that's, that's hilarious. Like there's a like few jokes that I could only tell to Johnny and Dave and they'll think it's the funniest thing in the world. If I said it in a crowded room, not so much. So to a larger degree, if you have a certain audience, like people who grew up in Ireland, right? There's a, there's a joke that you can tell them that you know is just going to kill, but, and it's really true to your author voice, but that larger audience is going to be lost. Where do you find that line? I mean, that is, you do have to ideally test it on a couple of people. Like I have, a, all the people who read my books are actually uh, three English people and an American, because that way I test the references automatically. I mean, there are things like I use Irish slang in my books, um, and I think I use it in such a way, I try and be really careful that when I use it, like the word gobshite, um, I've got a lot of emails about the oh, word. Oh, I'm going to stop using that word. That's good. How yeah, do I spell I'll, it? <laughs> it's just the word G-O-B and then shite. Uh, it's, but it's, it's a very, um, I love, it's one of my favorite Irish swear words. Uh, and I use it a lot. The Americans I've got, because you can get it from the context I use it in. Like you have to be careful how you do, but you can get it from the context. And once people get that, they kind of enjoy learning different things and stuff like that. But yeah, I mean, there is, you will get people like doing like you have to be careful not to write jokes that like you say you and two other people will get and they think it's the fun funniest thing in the world. But in a novel, you've got to be respectful of the, I think you've got to be very respectful of the reader's time and realize that you can't really do jokes just for a couple of people. You have to be careful with your references or else you're, you're marketing specifically to those people because obviously then it's a different thing, I guess. But I would say much like Easter eggs, um, you know, an Easter egg is supposed to be rewarding for the person who finds it and not distract the people who don't see it, like they just don't even see it. And it feels to me like a, a joke might be similar. You know, if, the, if you're making a reference that, that somebody who will get it will get it, but the other people won't, they'll be neutral to it. They'll, they'll not be distracted by it. Yeah, I mean, there, you can. If you do it right, you can obviously get one by that people won't. I mean, I um, do use names in my books. Uh, I'll be very careful how I phrase this. Um, well, actually, I, I do. There are, I use, because I'm terrible at... Um, character names like I literally can't remember a made-up name so I have to give characters real names and then change them at the end and in my first book and in my second one I just forgot a couple of them so they ended up being real people in the books and I had to, uh, which I don't recommend but luckily they were friends of mine so I got away with it um but yeah they're, they're, sorry I can't remember what the question was but the <laughs> well I, I think the Lego movie does a good job of that basically like easter eggs and like little jokes that the adults will get that the kids won't but there's enough kid jokes that you know everybody's pleased in a way yeah that's actually a great example like looney tunes did that too i mean I, there's this there's that whole category of of kids shows that people that the adults will appreciate because the adults are getting it and the kids aren't realizing that anything's missing yeah i mean there is that true i think the other example you could give of that actually not even from a kid's thing is a uh, family guy was Family Guy, like a lot of the references you probably didn't realize, but like um, there's American things that like literally me and other people know, and we only know them through Family Guy. Like I, I, we don't really understand what they are. Like what's the old, is it Mr. Rogers who used to tell stories? <laughs> I've literally never seen that. I just, my understanding- Oh, you're of, missing out, man. Yeah, it, 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 it seems amazing. Um, <laughs> yeah, Christine just said in the comments a little while ago that one of her daughters finally saw Silence of the Lambs and there was a Family Guy reference and so she started laughing hysterically while watching silence of the lambs because she finally got the skin suit joke yes yeah yeah i think the thing is though with that is they had so many jokes and to a, such a high quality yeah. that you were able to roll with it because i can remember at the time when especially when it first came out family guy was the most popular comedy show among comedians by a long way for <laughs> several years um i know like i've never seen it but curb your enthusiasm is the one everybody keeps telling me oh i oh. love that i had a feeling uh, it might <laughs> <laughs> um so when, when, you're, when you're writing comedy, um, how much of it comes during the writing process where you think of a joke or a, a situation which is funny and how much of it comes after? And thirdly, how much of it is just a refinement? Like, like can, can you write like a bunch of scenes and then just, okay, here's a good spot for a joke and then you think of a joke or is it more of a, a process that begins in the very beginning? I think generally... Now, especially now I've kind of getting better. I'm, I'm plotting out the narrative a lot more and I have an idea of certain things, especially because you know the characters, you know, well, that'll be funny if he's in that kind of area. Yes. Like um, a good example, like I, or I, I think what you can do is I have to do like, you know, there's those sort of set scenes you have. Like I had a scene where I had to get a body discovered in a, which is in a crime thriller is a really common thing. And mm -hmm. I needed a way to do that. 
And I literally had, right, I need a body to be discovered. And what I came up with then was, uh, I came up with this idea of uh, a girl who was in college, who'd like reinvented herself from being a real nerd in school to go into university and like, you know, reinventing herself. And she had this list of things that she wanted to do in her first year of university. And the last one was lose her virginity. And um, the chapter is basically her losing her virginity in a smart car. Um, and like all the stuff about that. And then she just notices a figure when, this, when, this, when the thing moves. She thinks there's somebody standing up in the thing watching them. And it basically became an unconventional way of finding a body, but it ended up being quite a funny scene. But you can do that where you get the result and then you work backwards and go, what can I do to get here? Um, which is a good way of doing it because that way you're respecting the story, which I think is always the most important thing. Now, a follow-up question. Uh, when you're writing a book series, like a show like Friends works because like you know the characters and that's what makes it funny because you know, okay, well, Joey's this kind of guy and it might not work as well if you don't know the characters, if you don't have an existing relationship. So later in a series, like book two, three or four, how do you, how do you make it so the how, what kind of shorthand or whatever you use to get people to know the characters well enough that you can insert the joke and they get it immediately? I think that is, you've got to remind people of the character a little bit, which is quite tricky. Um, like, for example, now I'm doing the third part of my trilogy, and that's actually, there's a prequel as well. And unfortunately, I've kind of written it in such a way that you need to know a lot of things that happened in the, the first book and the pre prequel. And I've had to find really ways of reminding people. Like I start off with one of the characters in therapy because that way she's talking about experiences she had and that got things in. And I actually came up with the idea of, um, I mean, this is, this, is, this is an extreme example, but you know, um, Scrooge, the, uh, you know, the, the, the classic story. Yeah, like with the movie with the, with, yeah, which, yeah. you know, was obviously all the different verses of it. Um, <clears throat> I basically came up with the idea that this guy um, is losing his mind a little bit and he gets visited by three people who died in the prequel because he's losing his mind. And it kind of reminds people of their place in it because I ended up, I kind of wrote my way into a corner and had to find a way out. And I Dave think loves it, that. Yeah. It's a, I, mean, it's, <laughs> I didn't intend to do it, but <laughs> I guess we'll see how it works out. But yeah, that, I mean, you have to be sort of creative in those ways to make sure you stick to the story. Otherwise you end up veering off and going into horrible, you know, getting no, going nowhere. Okay. Do you think that humor can be taught? Oh, that's always a big debate they have about like stuff. They can teach certain things. You can teach people like in a kind of broader sense to write jokes. You can teach people techniques that work. You can teach people um, like how to deliver a joke. Certainly you can teach people better. Um, but I think the instinct it has to be, you know, you do have to have the instinct in a certain level. Um, I mean, like I've written for TV shows for friends of mine when they're on TV. I've never written for their tours or anything. They do their own stand-up for that. Um, and... I, you can write to be like somebody, but at the same time, they have to be funny themselves or else nothing you give them is going to really work. Um, so you can't, you can teach certain elements of it. I think you can encourage, and a big, the biggest thing on all these things, like when you have a writing course, the biggest thing people get out of a writing course, I think, is meeting other writers and just getting the excitement and the, the belief where you're in a room with the same people who believe the same, want to do the same thing you do. But fundamentally, um, no. You can't really teach it, not long term. So you have to be at least a little bit funny and then you can get better. Do you, stop me if you know, know this. In Borat. Yeah. <laughs> if there, so there was a, uh, well, okay. So my son desperately wants to be funny, like desperately. And he's just not funny. Like he's, he's not funny at all. And he'll, he'll like tell a joke at dinner and he'll say, was, was that funny? <laughs> no, so no. Asking if it's funny. Yeah. <laughs> and no, I told him like, as soon as you ask if it's funny, it's automatically not funny. Like a hundred percent of the time. Like asking if it's good for you. Yeah, yeah. But, but he's, he really is trying and it is sweet. And he is getting, he is, does seem to be getting a little bit funnier. Like it just instinctively, but it's cause he's paying attention. So the, there's a story that I really love. There was this kid, this is a while back, and he just was always hanging out at, maybe it was the comedy store, I'm not sure, but uh, someplace in LA. He was just always there, always there, and asking to go up on like open mic nights, and the owner was just like, oh my God, just, just stop it, just go, go, it's fine. And he'd always bomb every single time. So he just let him go up when you know, no one was there. And then he would, you know, can I, can I pick up so-and-so from the airport? And he became the guy who would just go pick up the comics from the airport and, you know, check them in. And, uh, and, and he would always nag the people, you know, am I funny? <laughs> am I funny? Pick up, you know, picking their brain and talking about jokes. Anyway, that ended up being Chris Rock. And he was just, you know, 
Well, he basically just listened to Eddie Murphy and copied his entire act. Well, to, start off, to start off, he, he became his own eventually, but he was Eddie Murphy Jr. in the very Wow, beginning. okay, who wants to have a show with uh, Chris Rock and uh, Cease Sorry, He would have been it. <laughs> I don't know, else. I'm starting to feel like a really white guy all of a sudden. It feels like, <laughs> feels like we've got way too many white guys to have this discussion. I feel a little bit nervous now. Um, Remember when well, Sean wasn't a white guy? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's right. True. We've, we've, we've got, we're, we're like, yeah, good. Right, we're, we're fine. Um, to be fair, um, Eddie Izzard actually was, I've always, Eddie Izzard was considered the worst comedian in London for years. It was before wow. my time, but apparently he was terrible. He was always dying at gigs. People didn't get what he was trying to do. He actually set up his own gig because they couldn't get gigs anywhere else is the story. And then he sort of developed what he did. And then people started to like what he did. And people came to see him do it. And he sort of built up a cult following and then, you know, gradually became Eddie Izzard. But yeah, he did work and work and work and work. And like my, again, my old flatmate, Gary, is a brilliant one-liner comic. Um, But like he sits there for hours just looking at one sentence and moving the words around to try and get, to make it work perfectly. Like, yeah, let's talk about that for a second because it's, comedy reminds me in this way of uh, copywriting that it's, it's the sentence structure is so exacting and you need the words in this exact order. And if this word doesn't come before this word, it's scientifically less funny. <laughs> like, yeah. and, and, and I just want to add that the, the Chris Rock copying Eddie Murphy, I don't think that that was a bad thing. I think I and I think for your son that would be a good thing to watch other comedians. Oh, we, we do that all the time. We're like, okay, let's watch comedy, let's study it. And you're you're totally right, Dave. It's that Ira Glass thing, right? It's when you're first starting, you don't you're not good at what you do, but you have taste, you know. And I think that's actually what Quiva is saying. You have to have that instinct. And even if Chris Rock was terrible at telling jokes, he still had the instinct to like, oh, I know that's funny. Like that's funny. I want to be funny like that. So it's, but it is, it's diligent practice, all of this. Oh, it is kind of weirdly a sort of scientific mind in a weird way. Like you do get slightly obsessive about it. Um, yeah, you do have comics who are constantly trying stuff out on you. Like, is this funny? Is that funny? Um, and it is, you do have to, there is a lot of like, you, you have a certain type of mind. Like I, people always ask, was I always going to be a stand-up comic? And I thought, oh no, I was definitely not. But there was like, there was back in the day when stand-up wasn't that popular, there was one stand-up show on British and te- Irish television. And I can remember it was like 11 o'clock at night on a Saturday night. And I didn't know why I was doing it, but I recorded it. And then I watched it three times back to back, like every week. So yeah, it's, um, you do have to kind of study it that way. Hmm. So how, how, how uh, for writing or, or reading, what, what, what sort of, because I think there's a lot of examples out there of like TV shows and movies that people can watch. But for reading, I, I mean, are there specific comedy books that you would recommend or authors uh, that, that people can read and sort of get a feel for what works a little bit? I think it depends on the genre you're in. Um, I mean, like Terry Pratchett's part of my all-time favorite author, and he does sort of fantasy things. But he's a great example because he started off kind of doing jokes about the genre, really. He was talking about like funny, uh, basically t- taking the piss out of Lord of the Rings, really, in the first right. couple of books, kind of. Still good books. But then as he went on, they became much more satirical. Um, and it was great because he was making points while using, you know, he made like, there's a lot of things in his book about his views on racism, but he does it with orcs and all these things, which is really beautifully done. Um, and similarly, Douglas Adams is amazing. because I think Douglas Adams does get copied a lot, but in the wrong way. Because people think, oh, you just do wild, crazy stuff. And he did, but he also did try and tie it to a story. He was so clever though. Like it, he, never put, he never put the comedy before the story like that. It was always, okay, here's the story. Here's the things I want to say. And the comedy supports that. And that's what made him funny and not just, that's why his stuff is still good today. And it's, it's, it hasn't been disposable. Again, there's no half-life to really good story. There's more of a half-life to jokes than there are to really good stories. So if you look at like classic comedies, the comedies that have held over time, aren't the necessarily the funniest with the most edgy jokes of the time. They're the ones that have the best stories. Yeah, absolutely. It is those, those, those things people sort of cling on to. I and mean, it's amazing. You will see, yeah, I've, I've watched like sitcoms. And I did, when I was first starting off trying to write radio comedy, um, there's a weird thing where if anyone looks for radio comedy scripts, you get all these old time American ones, like from the 1930s, you know, all the ones with like Superman and all this sort of stuff. And they're fascinating to read because actually they are now more offensive than 
anything you could like just because of the terminology and stuff. And it's amazing how the language changes, which is a real thing. Like in a, like you do have that in comedy. Like there's the do you know the League of Gentlemen? Um, the the yes. TV show. Yeah. That doesn't get repeated very much on TV. And, and I don't know this, but a friend of mine has a theory that the reason it doesn't is because there's a, there was a joke about a taxi driver who was a transgender character in it. And now they look at that and go, even them, and that's quite a modern one, and they weren't trying to be, you know, but they, they look at that now and probably broadcasters go, ah, we're going to get trouble if we show that now. No one minded 10 years ago, but now, the, you know, and that's a, that's perfectly natural. Things change with these things and people's views of them change. And I'm sure the League of Gentlemen, they're actually making a comeback and they aren't going to do that again, I'd imagine. Or if they're well, do it's because co- good comedy usually is edgy, right? <laughs> it, it, it dances right on the line of what is traditionally acceptable or you know, it, it dances on mores. That's what makes things really funny. But if the culture shifts, then it can it can get dated kind of fast. And yeah, well, that it, sucks. It, yeah, like 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 the um, the Eddie Murphy special was it delirious? Where he's wearing that one piece thing and stuff like that. I don't know if you watched that recently. I watched all of them. Uh, yeah, I watched one of them recently, and he was doing a bunch of like gay jokes, and I was like. Ooh, I remember laughing at these when I was younger, but now it's like I'm cringing. <laughs> well, it's because the, the world has changed, and that yeah. that's a good thing. But you have to you have to kind of understand that pulse. Okay, yeah. last thing on comedy here is using comedy as like a, a Trojan horse to say something like kind of disguise your intent. Yeah, I was like that's that's the great thing because there's a lot of you know you can get it wrong a lot of ways, but the great thing you can do with comedy is because um, we all know when you're you know when you're you're writing a book. We all know there's things, the key things, especially in thrillers and stuff, you have to slip in these facts and introduce these characters that come back at the end and, oh, it's the killer and all that sort of thing. Um, and the great thing with comedy is it's a brilliant way of disguising it. If you can slip in some information in a funny scene, it's a wonderful way. It's like, you know, when you're given a dog medication and they just put the tablet in and then the dog licks around the whole tablet. If you can, if you can get it right, comedy can be the tablet the dog doesn't find until the end, and, you know. And it kills the dog. That's a bad example. <laughs> yeah, we have a, in our, our Robot Proletariat book, we have sex bots, which are really funny. Like they are, they are a comedic element, but they also, they're they there to- have real sex bots. It's not going to be yeah. funny anymore. <laughs> That's true. Um, but, but there's a lot of things that we're able to do thematically with them that catch the reader by surprise because they thought they were laughing. Uh, same thing with Baricio in uh, our very dark horror series, we actually managed to insert some comedy with this character named Baricio. And oh, no. it, it, actually, this again. <laughs> it actually works to deliver some information too. So I, I really like, um, I, I like humor as a Trojan horse a lot. Yeah, and, it, and, it, and the great thing is if you have the light and shade, like you can do serious things in comedy books. I mean, I do, in my last book, there are some dark things that happen. Like people go through some very bad things. I think as long as you're not trying to make a cheap joke out of a horrible thing, then you can, the contrast I think works really well because it's more shocking. The other side of it is it's more shocking because people don't expect it maybe as much. And it's a great way of, of sort of, you know, shocking people. As long as they like the character, I think they'll stick with it. You just have to be careful not to be too jarring, obviously. All right. So Queef, should I give your website or no? You- Queef, don't do it. <laughs> don't do it, man. I'm going to let Queef decide. Um, oh, it's oh. I mean, people can have a look at my website, but it doesn't. You know, it's not going to affect the books that much. Uh, it's whitehairedirishman.com. I think there's some clips of me doing stand up or something up there. But you can, yeah. yeah By all yeah. means, I mean, you'll never be able to spell my name. Literally, you can have fun. Tell you what, every, everybody, because you've not seen my name, I want you to write down five spellings of Queeve. <laughs> go to whitehairedirishman.com and see how wrong you were. We Has anybody have ever spelled, spelled your name right on the first time on the first try? Irish people probably. Yeah, not all of them. Uh, uh, no, generally, uh, almost nobody gets it right. Uh, the funniest one I ever had was somebody tried to bring me on stage once, an MC at a gig, and he wrote it out on a big card. And he said, I'm going to show it to the audience and get them to guess it. And went, please don't do that. I've got to go on and do 20 minutes. I don't <laughs> want to do that. And he was like, oh, and then I basically said no. And then he went up and did it anyway. And he went what to a guy, dick. <laughs> oh, yeah, he went to the guy in the front row and said, what does this say? And he went, Queeve. And he was like, <laughs> the guy go, Yes, that is correct. That is what it says. <laughs> we, got the one, we got the one Irish guy and 300 people. He just went, Queeve, isn't it? Um, was like, um, but yeah, my favorite mispronunciation of my name is Kump, uh, which was brilliant. I generally had someone walk down a uh, pitch because I work for a rugby team. And I, this voice behind me just going, Kump, 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 Kump. 
And then so like a steward went, I think that guy wants to talk to you. And I went, nah, that, that can't be right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and if he does, I don't want to talk to him. Yeah, no. <laughs> come, come, come sounds like some sort of weird sexual practice. I don't want to be involved. They're pumping. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Queef. So uh, thanks so much for being on. It was great to, to, to talk to you. Um, whiteheadirishman.com. Don't fuck up his also bots, but do enjoy trying to spell his name. <laughs> and uh, as to the rest of you, uh, I just want to leave a very late um, something cool. Oh, this is so awesome. <laughs> so oh, no. Christine, after hearing no. the, the, uh, <laughs> the would, would Dave go to a, you know, in, would Dave get high in a retreat in Colorado? <laughs> he created a page at sterling, sterlingandstone.net slash Colorado retreat. <laughs> and he just says, want to meet Dave in Colorado? And, you know, so if you, if enough people sign up, like, obviously, if we ever wanted to do this, we would then ask you to put down deposits and stuff. Like, just having a list is not, like, motherfuckers, we're not just going to do this on I'm Facebook. I'm serious, though. Like, Wait, if enough people did it. I, I'm in. I will say no, I am absolutely in. Dude, yeah. Johnny, we've got to go to Boulder next year anyway. We could actually schedule what? this, like, butt yeah, up against it. like, one of those paranoid high people. <laughs> oh, that's, that's, we're hoping so. <laughs> It's paranoid high. What does that look like, Dave? Paranoid. <laughs> yeah, that's. Come on, we like, we really need this to happen. My yeah. Oh my god, totally just signed up for the Colorado trip. Yeah, I think we should go there on a train though. We should start off with the Daves on a train thing, where it's Dave and four hundred other Daves, and then we can say the name. He goes, "What is it me?" It's like, and he gets really paranoid because everybody's him. So four hundred Daves on a train, then Rocky Mountain High in Colorado. Uh, and then All right. end up there. this is gonna happen so that was sterlingandstone.net forward slash colorado don't, retreat don't, don't sign up <laughs> please so, sign up there you go um so thanks everybody for listening and we'll see y'all next time bye. thanks bye bye